Good morning. We have made our journey through the Epiphany season to the last Sunday of Epiphany. And the last Sunday of Epiphany is always Transfiguration Sunday. Transfiguration Sunday was actually an introduction um, to the church here by the Lutheran Church. Um, And on this Sunday, we have a unique opportunity um, as we prepare this coming Wednesday to begin our journey uh, through Lent. Um, When we think about the theme for this season, it is uh, revealed. And over the period of time during the course of this season, we, it has been revealed to us um, in bits and pieces of who Jesus truly is. But there is no question about who he is on this last Sunday. And this revelation is so important for us as we begin our journey through Lent. And I will refer to this in my message for today. Today we're going to be taking a look at how this glory that we see on the Mount of Transfiguration is now part of us right now the gospel message and as the light receivers we are light reflectors in our lives Um, and obviously we look forward to that future glory where we will be just like Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. So with that in mind we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father on this Transfiguration Sunday as we celebrate the revelation of your son as your son as he reveals his glory to us we pray that we will be filled with great courage and great uh, hope as we see his glory revealed to us, knowing that he is indeed your son from eternity who has given to us and who alone can give to us eternal life. Bless our worship today that this revelation might become more a part of our lives so that it is seen more in our lives every day. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. As we think of our Savior being revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration, we begin this Sunday's worship with Hymn number 522, Beautiful Savior.
Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all your sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your sons. In your mercy, make us co-heirs of glory with Jesus, our King, and bring us at last to heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture readings are the readings for Transfiguration Sunday. And in our first lesson from 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, we see how the Lord took Elijah out of this world, not through death, but took him up into heaven in a whirlwind. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah was traveling with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord is taking your master away from you? Then he said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord is taking your master away from you? He said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Then fifty men from the sons of the prophets came and stood and watched them from a distance, while the two of them were standing at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, folded it together, and struck the water. The water divided to the right and to the left. Then the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask me for whatever I can do for you before I am taken from you. Then Elisha said, Let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. He said, You have asked for a difficult thing. If you see me being taken from you, it will surely be yours. But if not, then it will not. While they were walking and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire came and separated them. So Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha was watching and crying out, My father, my father, Israel's chariot and its charioteers. Then he did not see him anymore. He grabbed his clothing and he ripped it into two pieces. This is the word of the Lord. 
We now turn to the words which will serve as our sermon text for today from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled among those who are perishing. In the case of those people, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. Indeed, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For the God who said, let light who said light will shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. rise for a reading from the Gospels. For our Gospel reading today, we turn to the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 9. We begin our reading at verse 2, where Mark records Jesus' transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. We continue our worship with hymn 863, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Today we return back to our second lesson for today from 2 Corinthians. We're going to include chapter 4. We include the verses just prior to it as well. But I will just read to you the last verse once again where Paul says to us, For the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, on this last Sunday of the Epiphany season, we truly stand in awe of what we see on the Mount of Transfiguration. We also stand in awe of the fact that by the power of your Spirit, this same light of his glory now shines in our hearts through the gospel message so that we might see Jesus as our only Savior. Today, help us to better understand what it means that this veil has been removed from us so that we are able to see these things and that this veil has been removed so that we might shine your glory into the world. Be with us as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Revealing. That is what this season of Epiphany has been about. Today we see the greatest revelation given to us in the Epiphany season here on the Mount of Transfiguration. I have to believe that what these three men were privileged to see on the Mount of Transfiguration stayed with them the rest of their earthly lives until they had the opportunity to once again be reunited with Christ and experience that glory for eternity. Glory. You see, that what is, that's what this Sunday is all about. During the season of Epiphany, every Sunday revealed to us a little bit more of the glory of God as it is found in His Son, Jesus Christ. Every Sunday we received a little more of a glimpse into the life of Jesus, being more convinced of the fact that He was who He claimed to be, God's Son from eternity. This Son of God has done something truly remarkable. What is remarkable? What is remarkable is that the Son of God was willing to stoop to the lowest of depths to do what? To rescue us from ourselves, to rescue us from sin, to rescue us from death, to rescue us from the power of Him who brought sin into the world, namely Satan himself. There was nothing redeemable about us, and yet He came. And he did redeem us. And this one who has redeemed us now is totally unselfish in all that he does. And it is seen in the fact that now what he is willing to do is to share his glory with us. On this Sunday, we are lifted to a place to where Peter said, what to Jesus? Let's stay here. Let's stay here and we'll make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. We want to stay here and remain. And there is a part of us who wants to stay on the Mount of Transfiguration and not leave it. But what would have happened if Jesus would have given Peter what he wanted? We would have no glory. We would not be saved. We would have remained in our sin. We would be lost forever. As we move forward from this mountain, we will be descending with Jesus into the real world. A world of what? A world of sin and a world of death. A world in which, as we heard last Sunday in our second lesson, there is that enemy of the gospel, namely Satan, who is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking to deceive us, looking to separate us from Christ, looking to take us to a place where he resides, where the glory of God does not exist. Jesus must descend this mountain. He must travel to Jerusalem, and he must suffer and die in our place. To make sense of all of it as we make this journey through Lent, starting this coming Wednesday, I want to encourage you to always be looking over your shoulder. What I mean by that is this. Don't lose sight of the Mount of Transfiguration. We must remember who it is that we're walking with during these 40 days of Lent. 
Don't be deceived. He is not weak. He is not helpless. He is not confused. He is not at the mercy of these heretical teachers of the people. Who is he? He's God's son who is in control every step of the way. The spiritual forces that are at work, these evil spiritual forces, they think they're in control. They think that somehow they can stop God's grace dead in its tracks and make the fate of all sinful human beings helpless and hopeless. They believe that they will be able to show God to be a liar. That this promise that he made in Genesis 3.15 as he spoke to Satan himself will prove itself not to be true. But whenever you have those doubts and whenever you have those thoughts, look back over your shoulder again. Because he is not weak and he is not helpless and he is not at the mercy of these people. What he is doing is he is using their spiritual ignorance, their spiritual hatred to bring about the fulfillment of that promise that was first made in the Garden of Eden. Jesus will use his power in a way that we really cannot comprehend. Because if we had such power, we would use it for our own comfort and our own benefit. And yet instead, he does not use it for his own personal gain. He uses it for our gain. He uses it for the entire world. And for this reason, when we get to the last words that he speaks, in a state of humiliation... Those words should resonate in our hearts and our ears always and be the most precious thing that we have. You know what I'm talking about? It is finished. It is finished. He's not finished. It is finished. What is finished? God's plan to rescue us from our sins. For us to be able to see these things, though, and to understand these things, to be able to see the glory of Christ as it is revealed to us on the Mount of Transfiguration every day of our lives, we needed to have our spiritual eyesight restored so that we could look at Jesus in a new way with a new understanding. The glory that we see on the Mount of Transfiguration is not just something that we have now, it is something that we also have in the future. Now, how do we have it? Well, it is seen in the way we live our lives. This glory shines in our hearts. We are new people, people who have been changed with new desires, new thought processes, new purposes in life. Everything that we seek to do, we seek to do it to the glory of God who made all of this possible. As we bask in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ on this Transfiguration Sunday, May the Holy Spirit, through the words that he caused to be recorded by the Apostle Paul here in his second letter to the Corinthians, help us to better understand what it means when we say, the veil has been lifted. Let's make a deal. It's an old game show. Just discovered it's still around. People in the audience are called down, people who are often dressed in weird and strange costumes. And a deal is made. And then they have a choice of either choosing something under a box or choosing something behind curtains. But they have multiple choices. But they don't know what's under the box and they don't know what's behind the curtain. And after, that they, after they make their choice, then what happens? The curtain is taken away to reveal whether or not they chose the right one. Sometimes it's very good. Other times it's a dud. The gospel message is something that has been hidden behind a veil. Paul writes, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled among those who are perishing. In the case of those people, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. He is saying to us that the glory that is found in the gospel is veiled. Why? Because God has veiled it? No, God has not veiled it. The message is there for all to see, for all to hear. 
How is it veiled? Why is it veiled? It is veiled because of us. You think about this same apostle, how he writes to the Ephesian Christians and the Colossian Christians, and he reminds all of us that by nature we are spiritually dead. Think of someone who has died physically. How much are they able to see anymore? Nothing. They can't see a thing. They can't hear a thing. They can't understand anything. And so this is the way we came into this world. Born dead in our trespasses and sins. And so as we are born in this state, we are living in darkness. Spiritual darkness. And I'm not just saying some room that is dimly lit. I'm talking about an existence where you can, when you, if you put your hand this close to your face, you can't see it. You can see absolutely nothing. It is total, utter blindness. A blindness that does not enable us to see truth. What aids sinful man in this, to remain in this spiritual state of darkness is the one whom I mentioned a moment ago who was prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, namely Satan. The God of this world, as Paul refers to him. Jesus speaks of, this, of Satan this way. He says, you belong to your father the devil and you want to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and did not remain standing in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he lies, he speaks from what is his because he is a liar and the father of lying. In Jesus, we find nothing but the truth. Jesus identified himself as being the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Satan is just the opposite. Nothing that comes out of his mouth is the truth. There are half-truths in what he says, but his half-truths end up leading people astray and away from God, unable to see the truth of the gospel message. What does he lead people to believe? Well, he leads to people to believe that reveling in sin is a good thing. Following the desires of your heart is the way to go. He blinds their eyes and being able to see what the utter consequences will be from their sinful behavior. He leads other people to believe that, well, their form of life, the things that they are doing, these things are good enough to be acceptable in the sight of God and allow one to live in the kingdom of God, namely heaven for eternity. He leads other people to see themselves as the center of the universe, that they're God's to be worshipped. As Paul speaks to us here this morning about this veil being lifted, the terminology that he uses here says to us, in order for this veil to be lifted so that we can see what Satan is truly saying to us, that we can see the truth of the gospel, someone's got to intervene. Someone's got to come to us and do something. Because we cannot and God has intervened. He intervened on the basis of his mercy. And how did he do that? He was desirous to send his only son into this world to rescue us from this world of darkness. You see, Jesus is not in the darkness. He is not darkness. He is just the opposite. Jesus is light. And John introduces us to Jesus that way in the opening words of his gospel. He says, and Jesus was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You cannot put out this light. He is the light that penetrates this darkness, that shows us the truth. And that light that John is speaking of was seen the brightest in the life of Jesus in a state of humiliation here on the Mount of Transfiguration. But the light did not remain on the Mount of Transfiguration, did it? What the light had to do was follow the ultimate path of suffering. Paul would say to us in his letter to the Romans, he said, For at the appointed time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Why did Jesus refuse Peter's invitation to remain there on the mountain with his glory fully revealed? He did it because of his mercy. He did it because he loved you and me. 
And in that great love, he was willing to endure our darkness, the darkness of the cross. There at Calvary, he was willing to switch places with us and assume our guilt and assume our sin and assume the punishment that we deserve for that sin to make things right with God. You see, in Jesus, the darkness is defeated. For what he did there at Calvary was fulfill the words spoken by God directly to Satan in the Garden of Eden. He crushed the head of Satan. He leveled the fatal blow. And so as the writer to the Hebrews said to us, in assuming our humanity, he not only destroyed Satan, but he also destroyed death. Paul speaks of what he did in his letter, second letter to Timothy this way. He said, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, and it's now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, who did what? He abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So now, having accomplished his mission by destroying sin, death, and the devil, how does he bring this to us? How does he convey this light to us? How does this light get in us? Through the gospel message, through the preaching of the truth of the gospel. In the verses just before the words that were, our second lesson for today, Paul began this chapter by saying, Therefore, since we have this ministry as a result of the mercy shown us, we are not discouraged. On the contrary, we have renounced shameful, underhanded methods. We do not operate in a deceitful way, and we do not distort the word of God. Instead, by proclaiming the truth clearly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. When the gospel message is preached in its truth and purity, there is no hidden agenda. There's no deceit here. There's no evil intent. The message is plain, and it is the unvarnished truth. And what that message reveals to us, it reveals to us the darkness of sin in our life. It tells us what following sin is really about, what the ultimate consequences of it are. Not just worldly consequences, things that destroy us here, that ruin us in our lives here, but things that ruin us for eternity. But it also reveals to us that we in our helpless state who just have this constant desire to feed on sin and nurture this sinful nature that Jesus has now broken this. He's removed our consequences of sin because he removed that guilt and he's given to us in its place. He hasn't left the vacuum. He's now given to us his glory. It is the Holy Spirit who does this work through the gospel Paul wrote in his first letter to this congregation, he said, Therefore I am informing you that no one speaking by God's Spirit says a curse be upon Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit brings us to faith, the most incredible miracle takes place. I would say to you that if you were to ever go to a cemetery to visit the grave of a loved one. And when you get there, you see your loved one actually sitting there next to the headstone, ready to take on a conversation with you. You probably would not be standing very long. And you certainly would never forget that for the rest of your life. That's a miracle. That's what's happened to you and to me. We were in a spiritual grave. But the Holy Spirit working through the light of the gospel that speaks about Christ and Him crucified, that brings about the same kind of miracle in our lives spiritually. And all of a sudden, these eyes that could not see are able to see the lie and the truth for what they are. Our spiritual hearts are now alive again. They're beating. And now we have ears that are willing to listen and want to hear and are able to hear the truth and understand the truth and to put the truth to practice in our lives. What actually happened is this. 
If you go to the words in the previous chapter, right before our text, Paul stated it this way. He said, whenever someone turns to the Lord, whenever someone comes to faith, what happens? The veil is taken away. The curtain is opened. We are able to see what Christ has given to us. It is for that reason then that Paul says to us in the sixth verse of our text, he says, for the God who said light will shine out of darkness is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Obviously, this is an allusion to creation. The same God who was able to create physical light to bring that light out of nothing is the same God who has the ability to take these hearts and to shine his light into our hearts. You know, as Paul writes these words, I wonder if Paul was thinking about his own personal situation. Paul, wonderful, glorious Pharisee. As he speaks of himself in the letter to the Galatians, a Pharisee of all Pharisees. And he was a Pharisee of all Pharisees in his hatred for the gospel and his hatred for Jesus. Nothing could keep him from arresting Christians. Nothing could keep him from putting some of them to death, from torturing them. And he had gotten permission from the leadership in Jerusalem to be able to go to Damascus and to carry out their work of stopping this message of the gospel and arresting Christians. Well, little did he know as he began that journey that day that his life was going to totally change. In the book of Acts, we are told, as he went on his way, and was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? And he replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What happened to Paul this day? Baal was removed. This one that he hated so much, this one who he despised so much, this one whose name he never wanted to hear preached or spoken of ever again in his lifetime suddenly became the one who was the dearest to him, the most precious. He saw Jesus for what he was. His dark heart was suddenly filled with the light of the truth of the gospel. And what did the light of the gospel do in his life? It was reflected into the lives of other people. Paul lived out the words of the Apostle Peter who said, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the people who are God's own possession. For what purpose? So that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, this is why Paul did not lose heart in the course of his lifetime here on this earth. He looked around and he saw how many people for whom this gospel was still veiled in their lives. But he didn't lose hope. Why? Because he looked at himself and he said, listen, if God can do this in my life, he can certainly do this in the life of anyone. Paul's message was Jesus Christ. Nothing but Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the heart and the center of this new covenant that was established at, at Calvary. This is what makes this ministry of the New Testament, of the New Covenant, a triumphant ministry. A ministry that far surpasses the ministry of the Old Covenant. You and I have been blessed and privileged to receive this wonderful light, the message of the gospel. You are a light receiver. You have received that light. That light is now in you. Now, as a receiver of the light, you are now to be a reflector of that light. All believers today are given the same ministry. For some, as the Lord intended for me in my lifetime, I was called into the full-time ministry to preach and teach the gospel message. But... That does not exclude you from this ministry. You are a part of the ministry of sharing the gospel of message to the world as well. Because what did Peter say in the, in the verse I read to you just a moment ago? You're all priests. All priests who have the obligation, have the privilege of letting your light shine into the world, as Jesus said. 
And as we proclaim this message of the light, you and I can be just as bold as Paul was. Why? Because the message hasn't changed. It is the message that Jesus Christ is Lord. The message that is just as powerful and effective today as it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Paul was carrying out the ministry he had been called to. This ministry never fades. The glory of the gospel never fades. It remains just as bright today as it ever has. When we let the glory of Christ shine forth in our lives, as we do everything to the glory of God, we let the people around us see that light, just as Jesus allowed them to see that light, just as Paul and Peter and the other apostles let that light shine in their lives. As this glory shines in our hearts through the gospel, it also gives us hope in this respect. It reminds us that what we see on the Mount of Transfiguration today is our glory for eternity. That future glory with Christ fills us with hope as we still live in this world that is filled with darkness and the God of this age is still veiling the minds and hearts of individuals. We still live out each day with hope and joy and peace. As Paul said in his letter to the Romans in the 8th chapter, he said, For I conclude that our sufferings at this present time are not worth comparing to what? To the glory that is going to be revealed in us. When you get down and you are discouraged and you are struggling with whatever it is, look to the Mount of Transfiguration because that's the one in whom your hope is. Even though he goes down from the mountain, he looks weak and he is crucified and he dies on the cross. Remember, three days later he rises again glorified. He's victorious. They could not stop him. And he's now sitting at the right hand of his heavenly father doing the exact same thing he did in his lifetime. Did you catch what I said earlier? The evil forces that were at work in the heavenly realms thought that they could somehow stop this mission of Jesus. They thought they were in control. The Sanhedrin thought they were in control. Pilate thought that he was in control. Jesus told Pilate, you're not in control. None of this would be happening, he said, unless I allow, didn't allow it. That same one who was able to work all this out in the midst of all this anger and hatred works out everything for our good now seated in his glory in the heavenly realms. In heaven, there awaits for us a glory that we cannot even begin to imagine. It's a glory that Jesus possesses and that he in his unselfishness and love for us says, I want to share it with you. I want you to have this as well. That glory will become complete on that day when he comes in all of his glory for all the world to see. And he will call to the graves of everyone and call everyone back to life. And to those of us who placed our trust in him by his grace, he will take these lowly bodies and transform them. They will be changed, metamorphosis will take place because our bodies will now become like his glorious body, imperishable, never to die again. Paul gives us this assurance when he says, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, he will transform our humble bodies to be like his glorious body. From that day forward, body and soul will be glorified with him for all eternity. Jesus did not bask in his glory here on the mountain. Instead, he did what? He put the veil back on and he came down the mountain. Came down the mountain to endure shame and suffering as we are going to see now as we move this week into that season of Lent. All for what purpose? So that he might share his glory with us. 
God in his grace has chosen us and made that choice complete in our lives by removing that veil through the preaching of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we now through faith see Jesus for who he truly is, our only Savior from sin. May you be filled with this glory more and more on a daily basis as you are connected with that glory in the message of the gospel so that you might be a glory reflector into the life of someone else who does not have the light shining in their life, but that God through you might bring that light to be in their lives so that they too might be a light reflector to the world. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us join in making confession of our Christian faith together this morning with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, on this Transfiguration Sunday, we make preparation to come down from the mountain with your Son to once again retrace his steps that would lead to an unthinkable event. The Son of God, willing to assume the sins of all mankind so that he, through his suffering and death, might remove our sin and give to us the glory that is his from all eternity. Help us to better understand those things. Help us to better appreciate what we have in you. Let the glory that you have given us in your Son be seen in our lives every day. Help us to think, to speak, to act in ways that reflect this glory into the lives of others. Help us to be those who boldly and without reservation and without doubt share the message of the gospel, understanding that with you, All things are possible. With us, it is not possible to remove the veil, but you can and you have. You've done it in our lives and you can do it in the lives of others. But that's not going to happen unless we share the gospel, unless we live the gospel every day. And for that to happen, we need to be plugged into this glory all the time. We pray that you will give us hearts that are willing and desirous to be a part of Bible study, opportunities that we have beyond our opportunities to gather on Sunday mornings and worship to better grow in our knowledge and understanding of the gospel, 
Please help us to stop allowing other things to interfere with our time with you, to give us a sense of our, what our priorities truly are. And then when those, priori- those opportunities are presented to us, make us bold, just as Jesus was bold, just as the apostles were bold in speaking the wonderful message of the truth. Bless us as we ask these things in our Savior's name, who has also taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. During the distribution of the Lord's Supper, the congregation will sing hymn number 670.
Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We close our service today with hymn 518. We will sing stanzas one and three. <laughs>